I'll take it. Um, so we came to D.C. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, we wanted to raise awareness about the, the organization. Obviously, uh, there was a major ruling. And uh, we wanted to uh, inform members of Congress uh, about what our goals are. You know, there's actually a lot of misconceptions in the media, especially uh, about this being about salaries and things like that. And um, you know, we have a track record of over 13 years. Uh, we've never endorsed and advocated for salaries. This is about basic protections. Um, so to kind of uh, give some accurate information to the people in, up in Congress, and also uh, honestly to play a little bit of defense, because uh, you know, with this ruling, college athletes now have have asserted their rights and it's been verified by the NLRB uh, regional director and uh, under current laws uh, these guys have prote protections and rights and the last thing we want to see is is the NCAA or NCAA sports come up here and and use their their lobbying power to change the laws and strip players of their rights so uh, there's two reasons why we're up here and who'd you meet with I, I know I'm not gonna remember all of them but um, uh, Senator Harry Reid was a uh, um, very very outspoken uh, uh, supporter. How, well, yeah, what was his message as you interpreted it? I mean, it, it was a lot like ours. You know, players players deserve the right to form a union. Uh, they're not treated fairly under NSA rules, and, and that he supports it 100%, and, and he'll do anything he can to help. Um, very strong support. And uh, Sherrod Brown, uh, Senator Sherrod Brown, echoed very similar sentiments, as did uh, Jan, uh, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, who um, represents Northwestern in her district, as well as uh, Congressman George Miller. Uh, a, a number of people, Congressman Bobby Rush, John Conyers. Um, so we have some very positive meetings uh, between the last today and yesterday. And what, what, were, what were their concerns? I mean, did they have any issues with what you're doing at all? No, um, actually they were, they were grateful to hear a little bit more about the specifics. Um, they followed, many of them have followed these issues for a while, um, but, but never in the, through the lens of whether or not college athletes should form a union. Uh, fortunately, we you know, a lot of support on that, but um, in terms of the specifics, um, you know, what would, this, what would this lead to in terms of Title IX, not revenue sports, all the different um, questions that the average person kind of wonders about. So uh, they're pretty satisfied with the answers as we gave them. Mm -hmm. You know, the NCAA, when asked about it the other day, said, we don't need to be lobbying because the law is on our side. Are you worried the law is not on your side? Not at all. I mean, the, the ruling from the regional director, you know, it, it, it verified every argument that we made and, um, and ruled uh, that all of Northwestern's arguments were, were not applicable to the labor law. So, you know, that's an objective third party whose job it is to, to assess whether or not these players are employees. So um, the strength of that ruling was tremendous, and we know that uh, we have every confident, uh, every, every uh, bit of confidence that it will be upheld in the, in the review up here in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, is there any risk, and either of you can jump in, is there any risk in, in politicizing this issue? I mean, you know, the ABC News Washington Post poll from a couple weeks ago showed this great divide between Republicans and Democrats on, on the issue of college athletes forming a union, as well as whether to pay players. Um, you know, there were, there, there were racial differences, there were uh, gender differences. Um, is there any risk in coming here to D.C. and engaging this crowd? I, I think, you know, this is America. It's a melting pot. You know, the people have the freedom of speech. They have, um, you know, free to have their opinions. Um, I think at the at the heart of the matter, I don't think that it's political to to say that college athletes shouldn't be stuck with medical bills. I don't think there's a political issue to make sure that injured players aren't losing their scholarships, and that half the football and basketball players aren't graduating. I think there's you know in terms of what we're pursuing, I think there's a lot of unity. So I think there's more that you know kind of brings people together on discussion, um, in, in in the fundamental ways that that will actually make the difference. Okay, and this is your first time to D.C., right? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quite the uh, quite the entrance. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we came down here with some goals in mind. I'm trying not to be too much of a tourist and look around. And, Ooh, <laughs> wow, you know, so, uh, but it, it's been great. I've had a good experience. Yeah. What's been your role in these meetings? Yeah, I think uh, now obviously the, this is a, a subject that a lot of people are interested in, and, and they want to hear from from the players or, or somebody who is who's involved in it. Obviously, Mogi's a little older, <laughs> but. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's really just to in, in, inform them from the source and, and you know, tell them what the players are thinking. You know, obviously, um, not only representing myself, but you know, a lot of the Northwestern players, um, and, and just to you know, inform them about our goals and, and um, you know, what we think needs to be done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the vote, the election is now set for April 25th. Correct. How confident are you that the players are actually going to want Capita to represent them? 
I'm very confident, you know. All it boils down to is, is do you want to vote for having rights or, or not? And, and um, you know, I, I'm, I'm confident that these players, you know, obviously they, they made a huge pledge just to sign the cards. And, uh, you know, really the hard part is, is, is over now. All you got to do is, is, is vote yes and, and um, you know, really set the rest of the players up around the nation and the future generations up for success. And uh, that's, what, that's what it boils down to. Yeah, I mean, the reason I ask is I was reading the Chicago Tribune and a uh, player, Venrick Mark, Mm -hmm. was quoted as saying, you know, players knew what this would turn into. I don't think a lot of them would have signed union cards. Yeah, I mean, the media has their way of, of twisting things and, and making a quote, you know, sound like these guys are unsure, they don't know what's going on. I think, uh, you know, obviously we weren't going to be able to predict, you know, who was going to be for this or against this as far as alumni or, or what criticism that they were going to get. We knew there was going to be criticism. We knew there was going to be supporters. I think that's more of what the players are addressing. I think they knew, um, you know, how big of an issue this was and, and the potential that it had to, to change uh, the, the structure of college sports. I mean, there are 76 players who can vote. Mm -hmm. You need 39 to pass, right? Um, you, you feel like you can get that 39, obviously? Absolutely. You know, the, the key thing is, is these players aren't voting truly for themselves because you know, this is going to be an issue that's, that's dragged on down the road. They're voting for the future generations and they're voting for you know, the nine-year-olds right now who have dreams of playing college sports and it's really about are, are you going to uh, you know, set these, these kids up for success. You're going to allow them to have a voice and, um, you know, guarantee their basic protections and their basic rights. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think the, the players at Northwestern, they understand that. You know, obviously they're going to, you know, there's going to be, you know, a campaign against it and, and people telling them not to vote. And it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's healthy dialogue. They need to hear both sides and, and make their decision. And I believe that, that they'll vote yes. Since you announced that an overwhelming majority of players have signed these union cards, have you lost anybody on the team? It, you know, it's been tough. I've been, I've been out training, and I haven't got a chance to truly sit down and, and talk with them every week and, and see where, where they're at. Uh, I think it, it's tough when you have, you know, the, some criticism that they've got. You know, some, some people have, you know, came down hard on them, even, even people you know, within the Northwestern you know, alumni base, so, you know, that, that's obviously tough, but I think they're strong and they still believe in the issue. Mm -hmm. um, are, do you plan to talk to the players? I mean, you know, Yeah, I, can't, you, I mean, I can't wait to get back and, and talk to those guys. You know, I really haven't even got a chance to celebrate the win, so okay. um, it, it, it's big, and um, it would be great to go back, go back Saturday night and um, plan to spend a bunch of time with them. Obviously, I'm getting ready for my pro day, and you know, I'll be around the locker room, and you know, answer any questions, concerns, and just get back to just talking with those guys. Not even about the union stuff, but just, you know. They still let you time. in the locker room? <laughs> I, I hope, you know, they might have changed the codes on me, but somebody should let me in, so <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Uh, I heard, I don't know for sure, but I heard the coach talk to the team yesterday. Do you mm -hmm. know anything about that? Uh, I heard some some of that too, so I'm not sure exactly what he said, but you know, I'm sure they're they're having discussions. It's a big issue, and, and they should. Uh, do you feel like the school is influencing them one way or another, or are they staying neutral? How do you, how do you feel about? The, the, I mean, obviously, the university is is taking the opposite view uh, of us, so I, I imagine that um, they would want the players to to vote no, and you know, I, I think that's obvious. Uh, to what influence they're trying to, you know, put on or pressure they're trying to put on, I, I can't speak on that. But yeah. and remote, you were on uh, Stephen Colbert the other night. You held your own. I was. I, I was just trying to survive, <laughs> 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 hanging on for dear life. <laughs> the guy is just—he's so smart. He he's is amazing. He's he smart is. and funny at the same time. One thing he says this is one of his quotes. He says, "Now, when football goes away forever, I can blame unions instead of concussions." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, he's making a joke there, but I mean, what impact will what you're trying to do have on college football and college sports more broadly? Well, I think it's going to be uh, very positive. You know, this is the first step. We're starting with football and basketball. Um, it's, it's very feasible that players of other sports actually um, are ruled to also have similar rights. I think it's going to set a standard as well. You know, um, when football and basketball players, if they're able to, to be successful and get to the negotiation table and, and get some of these basic protections, first of all, asking, I think it's going to be very difficult for a school to, to um, try to explain to the players why they shouldn't have guaranteed medical expenses paid for, that injured athletes um, won't be guaranteed scholarships. And they're going to do that 
and, and in turn, whatever they come up with, that's going to be the information they're giving to recruits when recruits are asking about these same issues. So um, I think it's going to set a standard. And uh, the NCAA has a track record of at least you know, uh, articulating that it's, it, it intends to treat many of its athletes the, the same. Um, and I think it would be a hard time to say, well, we're going to make sure that the football and basketball players uh, have medical expenses paid for, but not the soccer player. So I think it's going to it's going to be a very positive impact. Mm -hmm. You know, like we're just talking about at the top of here. I mean, the, the DNA of the sports and society program is what's in the public interest. You know, so I want to pose that question to you. I, I mean, what you've described is what's in, in the player's best interest. Mm -hmm. But why should anyone, other than a football player or a men's basketball player at the D1 level, care about you succeeding? Why is unionization? a good thing for a broader group of people, for uh, society in general? You know, I think there are a few different issues. Um, I got my master's at, in public health at UCLA, and, and I see this uh, as a public health issue. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of athletes cycling through NCAA sports. And, um, you know, the question is, is whether or not these players have basic protections throughout, along the way and maybe afterwards. You know, are we, are we um, financing uh, systems in higher education that are being irresponsible with their bodies, you know, and, and uh, unnecessarily putting these young people at risk. Are these institutions in turn um, using some of the revenue that these players are generating to help them graduate and complete their degree mm -hmm. and in turn um, allow those players to become uh, productive members of society, you know, um, employers, people who, who can, um, you know, revolutionize the, the next industry, you know, people who are good thinkers. Um, or are they uh, serving themselves primarily? Are they using what they have as a platform to enrich themselves as a priority and, and neglect these issues? So I think there are definitely issues, concussions as, you know, as well. You know, um, you know where, where are these people going to be? You know, a lot of the players that have these un unnecessary uh, risks, you know, who sustain brain trauma and trying to function later. Actually, I got an email, unfortunately, from a guy I, I played with um, who had head injuries at UCLA playing football and uh, has memory loss. He's younger than me. He has memory loss, headaches, and asks, hey, um, is there some resources for me? You know? and, and we didn't know a lot back then. Now we do. Now we do. We know reducing contact in practices can be helpful. We, knew, re we know now return to play protocols can actually uh, increase the health, uh, you know, the, the functioning of the brain down the line, making sure you're, you're treating it appropriately. Um, and, and for the NCAA and the commissioners not to come to the table and close the door on us and not take our meeting requests over this issue, I think it just goes to show where they're at and why you need a union uh, in the, in, and why society can be best served by players having a seat at the table on these issues. What would you say about that, Ken? I mean, what, why is what you're doing in the public interest? I think what it boils down to is setting up these talented young men and women. You're setting them up for success down the road. And you know, when you're young, you think that you're invincible, you're going to play the game forever, you're going to go into the professionals and make millions. And the reality is, you know, only 1% of, of college football players are going to go professional. So, you know, these young men and women, are, they're going to leave their sport and they're going to become integrated into society. And they have the potential to do great things. You know, they already demonstrate leadership qualities and perseverance, all these great things. And they have the potential to do great things, you know, for, for the entire public. But, you know, they need help. They need to be set up for success. And right now, they're, they're not. I mean, you look at the graduate, national graduation rate is like 50%. You know, you're not taking care of their injuries. So, you know, some of these people are going to, um, you know, have neurological problems down the road from concussions. You know, some of these people are going to need knee replacements. They're not going to be able to work. They're not going to be able to do the things that they can. Mm -hmm. And some are receiving a degree, but they're not truly receiving an education. And that's not setting, you know, these talented young men and women up who have the potential to do great things, setting them up for success to, you know, do their part in, in helping out society. And, and I feel like they could do much more down the road if we help them out during this critical time period um, that they're in in, in college sports. Well, what's in it for, say, female athletes, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people uh, who care about Title IX are worried about the impacts there. I mean, the ABC News poll showed, I mean, 17 percent of white women support this this movement. That that's your mm -hmm. weakest support area. I mean, like, people are kind of protective about. Mm -hmm. Gee, we've made all this progress since 1972. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are what are female athletes going to get out of this? The the 17 percent you said, I believe that was the pay salary type question. Okay, right. right. Um, and and that's not part of our agenda. And that's one reason why we're here in Washington D.C. This is not about salary. So although that 
was an interesting poll. It's actually polling people on a discussion that's not being had by either the players or NCAA sports, the people who run it. But uh, Title IX, this, is, this does not interfere with Title IX. Title IX is a law. And the schools, any negotiations that they make with male athletes, they still have to be in compliance. You know? and, and if that means you know, guaranteeing protections and, and other kinds of um, re revenue d uh, redistribution to the female athletes, then obviously that would be a, a help for them as well. What about, what about minors, you know, non-revenue male sports? I mean, are we going to see those disappear or be diminished because of you got to pay more to athletes or take care of them in some other way? Yeah, that, that's a lot of the rhetoric too. You know, first of all, they may also have um, rights under the labor laws. You know, and that will be determined. Um, but the big scare tactic is, is, is what's going to happen to the non-revenue sports if uh, football and basketball players are able to get better protections. First of all, you know, we got to point to the 1.2 billion dollars in brand new revenue. The infrastructure of college sports is paid for. With all its lavish expenditures, multi-million dollar salaries, you know, ridiculous facilities with luxury boxes, that's paid for. $1.2 billion on top of that. In what? That's TV money? TV money just from the uh, recently negotiated contracts in the five power conferences, the new college football playoff, and March Madness. Uh, so there's a lot of new money coming in. And that's above and beyond. Above and beyond. And, and just to put that in perspective, and please, this is not a proposal, but this is about, you know, if you divide that up, by all the football and basketball players at the top division, you're talking about eighty thousand dollars per player. You know, more than enough to comply with Title IX, cover health coverage, scholarships for injured players, increase the scholarship equal to cost, and have an educational trust fund. All the things that we're asking for, and then some. Um, and in addition, too, I want to dispel one myth: is that football and basketball are responsible and, and, and actually needed to fund all the other sports. Um, if that were the case, Division Two would not exist. You know, how do you have one hundred nine thousand athletes in Division Two? With scholarships across, you know, various you know sports, all of them being non-revenue, um, if they were not, if they were of no value to those institutions, and actually many of those players um, pay tuition, they're on partial scholarships. They actually generate revenue, and exposure, and school pride, which in turn, you know, can help donations. Um, they're very valuable, you know. And I think that um, they're kind of used as the, as the hostage in this when, when really there there is no hostage. Mm -hmm. The. Uh, the, the Kessler suit, I'm going to turn over in just a second here. The, the, the Kessler suit, uh, I mean, you're not arguing for, for, for salaries, anything above scholarships right now. Um, but do you even have to do that? I mean, that's essentially what Jeffrey Kessler is asking for, is to blow the lid off of, off of the, you know, the, the, the amount of compensation that a school could, could offer, offer kids. So is it, talk, talk to me about how the two, what you're doing, sure. interplays with what he's doing. First of all, uh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm an advisor to Jeffrey Kessler's firm on that case. Um, so whatever I say about the case does not represent the case, but I can give you my personal opinions and um, how it kind of relates to you know, all the advocacy over the years. The thing is this, you know, um, f for instance, scholarships. You know, a lot of people don't understand, and most players don't understand, that a so-called full scholarship doesn't cover the full price tag of the school. It's, it's capped below the cost of attendance everywhere. Whereas a, a, a full academic scholarship can cover the price tag, and the scholarship shortfall is about three to five thousand dollars per player per year. Um, Northwestern or any other school is not allowed to close that gap unilaterally. If, they, if it does, it'll be punished by the NCAA, and that is part of why we look at an antitrust um, violation as as an issue, um, because they're they're you know and, and they you know the idea is that the, you know the NCAA is is running these. Uh, these price fixing arrangements amongst all the schools in the nation, which in America, which is supposed to be based on free enterprise, uh, is illegal. You know, there's an, it, it violates antitrust law. So some of the, the things, the base protections we, we've been fighting over a decade for, uh, we can't make progress on because the NCAA is violating antitrust rules and it'll punish the schools for doing so. We can't have an educational trust fund, you know, to incentivize guys to graduate or support them when they don't. That would be an NCAA violation, you know, and, and actually the question is, is are, the, are those, um, salary caps basically are they illegal How, you know who gave the NCAA the right to do that and they, they were never given the right to do that they just have done it and it hasn't been challenged and finally uh, uh, Kane you know uh, you had that, that hearing where you had to make certain points about Northwestern and the control of your lives and so forth some people feel like you've painted Northwestern as sort of an uncaring football factory is that how you see them? Not at all I love Northwestern and I love my experience and nothing that 
I said in, in that testimony was a complaint is merely just pointing out the facts and we have a great employer you know we have a, we have a great boss and, and, and coach Fitz <laughs> and our supervisors our coaching staff you know they're great but that doesn't take away the fact that we deserve basic protections and basic rights and, and that at the end of the day that we're employees which the, the regional director just found and one thing about Northwestern is it promotes the you know the students to be free thinkers to be to be leaders to you know bring about positive change in their society so in a lot of ways Northwestern prepared me and you know the football team to take on this challenge to be the pioneers of this movement so you know I love the school I love coach Fitz but that doesn't you know take away from the fact of, of uh, yeah. They're going to regret uh, yeah. preparing, <laughs> you, preparing you this well, perhaps. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so let's open it up here. Anybody in particular? Dave. Yeah, a uh, question for Ramogi and a question for King. Uh, Ramogi, the NLRB ruling says that private college sports teams can unionize. It emphasizes the private college. Are there CAPA efforts right now to reach out to Stanford, Notre Dame, and other private institutions to extend this movement beyond Northwestern? Uh, we're not going to come on, comment on any um, organizing activities, but obviously our, our vision is that college athletes across the nation will, will have an opportunity to decide whether or not they want uh, the ability to collectively bargain. You know, and, and I think obviously there's there's challenges. This is not going to be easy. Um, the NLRB, as you pointed out, has jurisdiction over private institutions, not the public schools. Uh, the public schools are governed by a myriad of, of state laws. You know, there's the respective state labor laws. So. Um, there are some obstacles, but I think at the end of the day, we will come to a point where we can hit a critical mass and um, and uh, really, uh, you know, kind of jumpstart the the X factor, which is recruiting. You know, and at the end of the day, uh, these recruits and their parents, you know, when they know there's a collective bargaining agreement in place to to take care of um, the the players at a particular school, I think it'll it'll be a, a standard that will be set across the nation. And, and for Kane, th there are very real union drives at Northwestern among uh, graduate students, custodial workers, cafeteria workers, and a lot of them are really looking to you guys as a point of inspiration. Do you have any message for other people at the Northwestern community who want the same kind of seat at the table that the football players are asking for? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's great that, that this inspires a lot of people, and at the end of the day, you know, I just you know, personally believe that everybody should have basic rights and basic protections, and that you shouldn't have to lay down for those, so. Thank you. Tom? Well, as a former player, I can say I, I fully support your efforts, and uh, I think that the NCAA really has abdicated its leadership over the years because they have not listened to players or brought players more into the fold. And that's really why unions get started in the first place, is they're not listening and be accountable uh, management. What my question focuses really on your messaging because I think the the chink in the armor of the NCAA is that they say you're going to get an education and you addressed this a little bit and so did the, the National Labor Relations Board when they talked about the 50 hours you spend but so I think healthcare is important I think medical issues are important I think you know brain trauma is fine but the education trauma in this country where kids are walking out of these schools cannot read they're getting degrees that are worthless. I mean, it's not kids get a real education that will serve them for the rest of their life. And I think if you focus on that, that's the crux of the NCAA argument. We're giving you an education, but they're not. It's a faux education. And I think the most important thing you can do, and this is the question I have, is to really refine and say, look, the one right that we have is an education out of this deal, and we're not even getting that. And I don't think anybody across this country will disagree with you on that one. And uh, so that, that's my, sort of my question to you. I think you bring up a great point. You know, USA Today has done some uh, great stories on, on clustering, the fact that a lot of schools have these big clusters where the athletes end up uh, majoring in. You know, they, they really stand out in terms of the general student body. Um, one of the things that we have actually tried to address over the years is, is to, um, and we had a, a couple laws passed, the Student Athletes Right to Know Act in California and, and in Connecticut. Um, uh, one thing that, we were, that got stripped out of the bill was to try to give athletes a better idea of what they can actually major in, given the practice times. You know, you, you're, you're told when you go to these schools, well, here's, here's when practice is, schedule around that. Well, if, if you were recruited and you wanted to be an engineer or you wanted to be you know, in pre-med or, or any, any major of your choice, uh, it's really deceptive for the schools to say, yeah, come on, you know, we have that major. 
But when you get there, you can't take the classes. You can't take some of the prerequisites, and you can't pursue that major because you're, you're, you're scheduling your classes around the, the practice. Unfortunately, the lawmakers, for whatever reason, well, not for whatever reason, the university lobbyists, armies of them, actually work to kill these bills. And, um, you know, we, again, this is a track where we've tried everything, everything for the last 13 years. Mm -hmm. State lawmakers, Congress, uh, public pressure, uh, anything that we could do, and it, all of it has really come up short. And, and we don't have the luxury to, to kind of wait around, but I, that is an important issue. I think it starts with informing the recruits. What can, what, what can you actually major in here? And, you know, because if you want to go to a school for uh, engineering, but you can't be an engineer because of football or some other sport, then know that before you go there, not, not when you're knee-deep in it, realizing it as a sophomore that you can't take the prerequisites. Mm -hmm. um, guys, as far as we know, so Kane, I think you said when you first announced that you, you told Pat Fitzgerald the morning of the announcement what was about to happen. There's been some talk, you know, recently some people have written about how, well, the union, you know, could have its advantages for Northwestern. They think of recruiting, you know, something they could use as a tool. Have you, is there any chance or any thought to maybe sitting down with the university and trying to explain, well, this could be a, a benefit to you as much as it could be a benefit to us? Do you think they'd even consider hearing you out on something like that? I would mean, love to have a discussion. I think this is a healthy discussion, and I would like to you know, present the, the positive things that come from them you know, backing this. I don't know if they'll sit down with me, but you know, mm -hmm. I guess we'll, we'll see. <laughs> well, what are the positive things? Why, why would this be good? I mean, you know, for the could university? be recruiting advantage. Are you able to think, you yeah. know, negotiate better health and uh -huh. educational protections that are still within the NCAA rules, and now people want to go there instead of Stanford or something? From a football standpoint, uh, and, I mean, just from a sporting standpoint, as far as recruiting the best recruits, absolutely. If you're able to sit down with the recruits' parents and tell them that you're going to be guaranteed for medical coverage, you know, past your eligibility, that you're going to get five years of, of uh, education despite what your redshirt status is, whether you redshirt it or not, that you're going to get maybe, uh, if, you, if you don't graduate on time, that you're going to get extra academic support to help you out, that you're, there's going to be... Um, you know, concussion reform, concussion prevention within the program. Those are huge things that you could, if you could tell a recruit's parents that it's like, okay, well, Northwestern is, is on top of the game, and, you know, I, I want my son or daughter to go to Northwestern. That's huge. And then, you know, for, for the university to just, uh, you know, be the pioneers, to be the ones that, that are um, truly thinking about the players' interests, about players' rights, players' protections, for them to back this, I think would be huge and it would be a great statement, you know, on the right side of history. Some of the uh, some of the critics like Lamar Alexander have talked about how this could lead to a football team uh, striking right before a big bowl game or a basketball team striking before the Sweet 16. Is this just a ridiculous thing, or should that be an actual concern that uh, maybe not Northwestern, but some school could strike before a big game, I, or, or is it just ridiculous the idea that I mean, it's football, right football players, basketball players can strike right now without a yeah. union. I mean, if they don't want, they'll get grumbling. I mean, if if the Final four participants don't want to go play. They don't. <laughs> nobody's going to make them go play. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, from a union standpoint, we've we've never advocated for work stoppage or striking or anything like that. I think that we already have the leverage with, you know, um, obviously how uh, we're perceived from from the public and, and uh, the, you know the status that we have. Um, you know, we already have some leverage that, that we need to negotiate. We don't need to strike or work stoppage or anything like that. Can I ask just just one more question about that? Um, well, it's, it's a different question, but I know right now your goal is not to advocate for uh, salaries, it's just for player protections, but do you see down the road, once you have more schools on board, like you were saying with your vision and you, and you have a lot of schools on board, do you think that that's a potential that someday you could advocate against the NCAA's rules of no, no salaries for the players? Uh, you know, I, I point to a, a track record of over 13 years of, of um, advoca advocating for these issues and I'm not that patient. <laughs> you know, I just and the, and the college athletes. You go in these locker rooms. They're not. They're not saying. You know, maybe you know. Can it, can this lead to salaries? You know, they'd be happy with cost of attendance scholarships and some other protections. Um, you know, at the end of the day, people say, "Wow, there's you know here, here's a union. These players are going to run the run the system." There's also the universities. This isn't grabbing all the power. This is actually sitting down as equals. And the schools and the university, they don't have to do anything that they don't want to do. You know, so if they, you know, even if some players brought it up down the line, they don't have absolute power. Right now, the NCAA has absolute power, but the schools and the NCAA and the conferences are there 
uh, to also represent their interests and in how they see college sports fitting within uh, higher education. So um, I, I think that's a, a really a empty thread. It's kind of a you know uh, something that's really juicy and fun to talk about in circles. But again, the reality is you know the discourse for over a decade has been about health and safety and, and graduation rates. Thank you. you can correct me if I'm wrong, Tom. Did, didn't the NBA Players Union start when Oscar Robertson and some stars basically decided we're going to sit out the All-Star game if you don't if you don't fix this? And I know that was the timing of it. Uh, I they, can't remember. They had a union, but it wasn't a strong union. Yeah. So basically, that's how they that's how they Actually, got the protections. Actually, the union was started by Oscar. Robertson. So you guys can have some more stuff. No, no, no. <laughs> I, just <laughs> regarding that, uh, it's one thing for us to say, uh, and when I say us, um, the media members, to write about and talk about and go on TV and talk about the hypocrisy of college athletics. It's another thing for someone in it and uh, very intimate with all the surroundings in it to go out and say that. I'm just curious, is the worst backlash either of you have received in any form or fashion? Have you lost friends and boosters uh, that maybe supported you before uh, said, you know, I, I can't support this? What's the worst thing that's happened um, in this journey, I guess? Uh, I mean, me personally, I haven't lost friends or, you know, if, if any people that I went to college with were against what, I was, what I've, I've been doing, uh, no one's voiced their um, concerns about it. Um, the only thing that really stands out was uh, there was a high-profile basketball coach that, uh, you know, started hollering at, hollering at me uh, over the phone when, uh, when I tried to inform his players about their protections and kind of said, who are you to come and mess with my program, that type of thing. And I asked the coach, well, what are you doing to protect your players? Because there's, there's more things you can do. And uh, he didn't really want to hear it, but, um, you is know, that's that to be expected. Is that since you, since January 20th? No, no, no. Oh, that's, I'm talking about in my overall experience. But really, really not, not too much. Did you hang up on Calipari? <laughs> it wasn't Calipari. <laughs> no, Calipari before, probably. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But uh, how about you, can have you experienced any real... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a rocky road. It's been a roller coaster, and, uh, you know, we, we expected some critics, and I can honestly say that there's probably been some, some bridges burned. Um, I think the toughest part for me is, uh, you know, that there's some former teammates of mine who, who have, you know, graduated now that, that spoke out in the media, and, you know, the thing that was frustrating is I didn't get a phone call, and, and they didn't want to, you know, ask me what this, what, what, what's this all about, you know, Tell me about it, you know, before you form your opinion. It's almost you know, jump into conclusions or, or read an article and make assumptions off that. So I think that that was probably the most frustrating thing for, for me. Mm. But um, you know, I think you know, time heals all wounds. So uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what will come from this. And all I know is deep down in my heart, I'm doing the right thing. I'm always doing the right thing. These players are doing the right thing, and uh, that's all that matters to me. Mm. Uh, my question is for you. Uh, I was wondering, since the drumbeat from the other side is always your students, it's about academics, they're there for academics. I was wondering if you personally feel as though you were able to fully take advantage of the, econo or the academic opportunities at Northwestern and whether the time you spent on football um, made that challenging. You know, I, I think um, at Northwestern we, we have one of the highest graduation rates every year. And I think that's a testament to our kids and you know how well they can balance the the you know, sports demands and their and their educational demands. Um, but I can definitely say that you know when you when you're dedicating so many hours to your sport, it's hard for you to ever reach your, your true academic potential. As if you were just a full-time student, you could dedicate your whole time to being uh, a scholar. Um, so I, I, I can definitely say that. But at the same time, you know. There's a bunch of uh, you know alumni and, and players are going to do great things, mm -hmm. but um, you know I, I could definitely say that you don't reach your full academic potential if you're solely focusing on, uh, on your schoolwork. So um, yeah, the NCAA mission goes along the lines of uh, trying to nurture student athletes, and as you have attested to, they haven't been doing that successfully and to the full extent that they could. Um, do you see that there could be a system separate from the non-revenue-generating uh, gen uh, sports that that they can create for maybe men's basketball and uh, men's football? I, I think they've already done that, you know, um, to a large degree. You don't see the, the facilities and the salaries uh, in the other sports um, that you see in football and basketball. And, 
You know, I think in, in some in some respects, it's it's own, they're these own industries. Football is its own industry. Basketball is its own industry. The rest are traditional non-revenue sports, just like you'd see in high school, Division three, Division two. Um, so I think there's already um, a, a market difference between uh, those sports. You think they would have different types of rules when it comes to, I guess, the scholarships that they're providing, or um, well, they already do. They do. You know, um, football and basketball players get full scholarships. And the other sports, there's a lot, many sports that, um, you know, people are in partial scholarships and things like that. So it's not even across the board. The treatment's not even across the board. Uh, the demands and risks, they all vary from sport to, you know, and the, and the time commitment from sport to sport. Um, so, you know, they all, they all have their unique um, characteristics. Tom alluded earlier to the, the concerns raised about the Title IX implications and the non revenue sports across the board. Um, what can you say that would be reassuring to those communities about the impact that this might have on, on, on those athletes who, you know, after all, are the majority of college athletes? You know, I, I think, again, you know, a lot of it's the resource question. And, and, you know, 10 years ago when we first started out, you know, we, we were uh, told that there was never enough money to, to cover the basic necessities. These are legitimate issues, but unfortunately, you have to go somewhere else. And, and in the last decade that we've been advocating for these very um, issues, the revenue has exploded and the issues have still been left unaddressed. So it's, there's not a revenue problem. You know, if there's not a revenue problem, then there's no threat, you know, in the traditional through the traditional lens of saying that the revenue is necessary, you can't take existing resources, and if you were to do that and redistribute it, it would hurt non-revenue sports or uh, you know Title IX opportunities. Um, so it's really um, it's really an unfounded scare tactic, you know. And again, um, looking at Division Two, uh, when you're talking about how much revenue is produced to support all the sports, the, you know, all, and with the exception of Div Division One. All of the college sports and all the other divisions in high school, any kind of institutional, uh, educational entity, whether it's high school or up, it's funded by taxpayer dollars or tuition, you know, or, or student fees. And that's the typical um, standard. And actually, you know, one of the things that I, I believe is that, you know, the school that makes tens of millions of dollars off of their football and basketball teams has, has no business asking students to, to, you know, to pitch in, you know, and raid in the student, student funds. It just it doesn't make any sense. And again, it all boils down to a conflict of interest and greed, and, and those are the priorities, unfortunately, of the people who run NCAA sports. So, Kane, what ex during your experience at Northwestern, is there anything that you think you couldn't have done without a union, for example, Let's say you asked Coach Fitz for some of these protections that you're asking for now. Do you think it would have been possible to get those while you were in school without this union, or does the union have to happen for that to happen? Yeah, I think um, if it could have been, po I mean, if it was possible, it, it it would have been done. You know, I don't I don't see us. Um, you know, we had a leadership council structure there. I don't see us as a leadership council saying, "Hey, uh, hey, Coach, I think we need to guarantee medical protection extending five years past our eligibility." I mean, that's, that's not a topic that, <laughs> that we could bring up to coach and that, you know, he could make a decision on, I'm sure. The answer would have been, you know, why well, have to go check with the athletic director and, and see what, you know, it, you know it's, it's above our heads. And just as Ramogi was saying, it's, it's not about players grabbing, you know, control and saying, you know, we're the most powerful right now. It's saying we're equal. Let, let's sit at the table and discuss this. And for me, it's simple. It's just us having a voice and, and uh, you know, having our voice heard. It's, and I'll, I'll point out, I just want to add that, you know, um, it goes along, along the lines of verbal promises as well. You know, will that coach even be there the next year? He could be fired, reassigned, you know, take another job. Will the athletic director be there? Really, these, these policies, the athletic director in the budgets, you know, the athletic director is responsible for all of it, for the irresponsible spending, for the lack, in, lack of um, various protections on various campuses. You know, like, like Kane said, Northwestern does a lot of great things. Um, but at the end of the day, without a collective bargaining ag agreement, without something that's real and guaranteed, it's all, um, these are all verbal promises, and we get plenty of calls about these uh, verbal promises that get broke, broken over the years, and you know, it, doesn't put, it doesn't protect players you know, in, in real terms. It always leaves the discretion to the athletic director or a coach. Now, there, there are many people who are calling for college athletes to be paid in men's basketball and football. Taylor Branch and Dave Zirin probably. Um, oh, yeah. So I, I understand from a tactical or a strategic standpoint why that might not be a good idea right now. But I'm, I'm interested in knowing, do you think that on the merits, 
college athletes should be paid or are deserving of pay? You know, we just, we just, we have just demonstrated that college athletes are already paid. I mean, the dialogue on this, we have to really stop talking about these things in catchphrases because it, some of it just twists the issues a bit. So, but in, t in terms of salaries, I think is what you're talking about. Um, so I just want to keep hammering that a little bit because, the, you know, we have to change the discourse. They're already paid. The uh, question is, is do, you know, um, should they get additional resources? And if so, in what forms? You know, and again, I think we've laid out very clearly what the forms are, you know, in, in terms of um, things that the college athletes want and have, have vocalized and want to push for. Um. I, guess, I guess my question is, on the merits, do college athletes, do some deserve to be compensated with salaries? You know, it, it, this is Amer you know American citizens across the nation. As long as you're not doing th anything illegal, you'd have to question, you know, why should a, a group of Americans be carved out of American society? You know, but we we also cognizant of the way college sports has evolved, and and you know, also some of the pitfalls and you know uh, of of making progress, you know, at the at, at making progress without carefully de you know determining how this can go from here. I mean, if you're going to reinvent college sports and say, hey, why not make it like the NBA? You know, would anybody be against another NBA existing right now? I don't think too many people would have a, a, a problem with that, but college sports is ingrained in our society. The NCAA is, you know, um, really uh, structured this in a certain way. And college athletes are fine, you know, with the protections that, that we're laying out. You know, these are the things that they've been vocalizing. And so um, that's what we're pushing for. But would you agree that there's a big difference between the sixty thousand dollars that you're getting in student aid each year? I think that's the number the NLRB had, and a million dollar salary that you might be able to expect as a professional athlete. I, I mean, I understand the the argument that they are already being paid, but there's clearly a big difference. You know, going back to his question, do you think the you know the exceptional student athletes have the right to to make these big million dollar salaries or whatever the price is um, that the going right might be if they were in the pros? I mean, there's a, there's a big difference, I think, um, you know, in terms of our goals, we've laid them out, um, and, and who knows what some of these lawsuits are going to bring forward. I mean, the NCAs, they're, they're, you know, taking hits from all, all corners. I mean, they're going to have to think about how, how hard they want to fight. That's more of a question for the NCAA, you know, and I don't think that, um, you know, they, they would willingly go down that route. Um, I think m the more productive conversation is on the, on the sides that matter, you know, with all these theori theoretical, you know, situations, what does each side want or need or prefer, and, and to discuss at the, t at the table. Given that, um, given that you uh, uh, behold into a system now that's been in place forever, and, and the power structure within, we've seen the stubbornness um, they've shown over the bowl championship series uh, in regard to money and, um, and making a playoff system and what that would do to some people's pockets. Um, do you think their resistance is such that it's this is this is going to have to spread and eventually lead to the abolition of the NCAA for anything really to happen down the road? The NCAA almost has to be out of this. I, you know, I think there's always going to be a governing structure of um, college athletics, intercollegiate co college athletics. Um, whether it's called the NCAA, I don't think the NCAA even itself is going to go away, but I think that um, you know, a lot of its power will be stripped away. And uh, already you're seeing the conferences themselves you know, um, uh, taking some of that power away from them or posturing that they want more power and more autonomy. So um, the question is, should the NCAA be that heavily involved in uh, regulating every last you know, provision of a player's life down to whether or not they can receive groceries, you know, or whether or not a school can uh, provide a scholarship to a, st a transfer student um, whose mom is sick. I mean, it's just really inappropriate some of the things that they look at. You know, they investigate Johnny Manziel, trying to figure out if he received a, f a few bucks for signing autographs. Uh, but, you know, in the concussion litigation, you know, it was discovered that uh, they wouldn't even investigate if Johnny Manziel's coach knowingly put him in a game with a, con a concussion. And, and risked his life. You know, um, their legal defense is that the NCAA has no legal duty to protect student athletes. You know, so what is the role of the NCAA? There's a lot. Um, if it's going to be in a, a, a position of power, there's a lot it should do in terms of um, protecting and safeguarding players. And if it's not going to do that, there needs to be another way. I, but I do think there's going to be a governing structure, one way or another. Um, sort of on that note, um, came the uh, NCAA is now saying that the new Division One um, board of directors is probably going to have a student seat and will be able to vote. 
Um, and in some cases, they kind of point to that as evidence that they are doing things to improve some of the issues that you guys are concerned about. Um, and I was curious what you think about that, that there will be a student on the board, um, or a student athlete, um, and whether it might be an improvement for athletes across Division One. No, and I mean, even if they do that, the voice of that student athlete has no leverage. It doesn't you know, change if they're going to listen to them or if it has any influence on their decision. At the end of the day, you need leverage. You need to be equal again. And um, that's, that's just what it keeps boiling down to is we need to be equal. We need to have a voice. We need to have a seat at the table. I mean, and that's what it is. And, and them hiring a, or you know, promoting a student athlete to, to talk in their meetings you know, is, is not the same thing. And just to chime in, I, I believe the board of directors is, has 18 college presidents, and they're proposing one college athlete as an equalizer in discussions on um, critical issues that the NCAA has ignored. I don't think that's uh, for many reasons. You know, uh, first of all, just the numbers. Second of all, the fact that that player is going to be under the thumb of the school, uh, just like the actually the national sack. You know, they they came out actually while we were flying airplanes in protest around the NCAA convention. The college athletes need a voice uh, inside members of the national SAC were saying that they're being muzzled and they yeah. can't address these issues. So um, I think they're putting lipstick on a pig. No respect, no disrespect at all to the players because the players, you know, first of all, a lot of them are kept un uninformed and obviously they're, they're, they're kept without any kind of leverage or power, which came out in the Chronicle uh, piece on, on how they've been, been, been muzzled. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of discussion about um, trying to find alternatives to reinvent the wheel. You know, the wheel has been proven in multi-billion dollar industries how players protect themselves is to form unions. I, I just uh, interviewed Eric Winston, the new president of the NFLPA. He came out hardcore for everything that you guys are doing. Um, have you spoken to the NFLPA since this started? Have you spoken to any of the other sports unions? Have you spoken to the AFL-CIO? What kind of broader labor union solidarity have you guys received? Um, we actually just we met with NFLPA. Uh, I mean, they, we, we've D. Smith and um, you know Georgia Tala. And now Eric Winston, uh, Dominic Foxworth, who's the former player president, they've been extremely supportive. They've been in our corner the whole time. Um, as soon as this um, this was announced at Northwestern that players had signed union cards, they came right out to start supporting it. Um, so did the AFL-CIO. Actually, they released a statement in our support. So, um, you know, we expect to have more dialogue with uh, with organized labor, um, and um, you know, for one, to learn from them and, and to get advice, but. Um, also to show that, that, you know, players across the nation, that they're not alone. Who did you meet with today, the NFLPA? Uh, D. Smith, George Atala, and um, Eric Winston were all there. Did he make any new promises uh, to work together or support you in some particular way? Yeah, I mean, he's just always been in our corner. You know, um, we're not going to talk about any specifics, but, you know, he's consistently, all of them have been consistently in our corner, and, uh, you know, it, it goes a long way. You know, I was going to say the... You've been at this 13 years, so you think about it, where is it going to be 13 years from now? I'm kind of the chaos theory guy that I, I'm happy to see what's happening here because I hope I think the whole system has to blow up and be rebuilt. But, you know, think about where this goes down the road. Let's say you win all the court cases and now you have the rights. Then you got to go to the public institutions and they got to get one big mess in college sports, which is actually I applaud because I think if that mess gets bad enough, you're going to go back to the drawing board. Have you thought about? No, I've thought, thought, thought about. It. I don't. I don't, I don't have the same vision, <laughs> of course. Um, you know, first of all, some of the okay. things that you're talking about to me, I see those as some of the transitions, not mm -hmm. not the end point. Thirteen years from now, I see more of the stable, the very stable leagues. You know, relatively, you know, peaceful leagues. Uh, the other, the other professional leagues that have been relatively uh, stable and productive, that have grown in uh, popularity and revenue uh, exponentially. You know, in the last several decades. Well, why would you be happy just with medical and a few and a five-year scholarship? Why, why, your agenda will continue to grow over in 13 years. If you're successful, the courts in three years, your your agenda in 13 years is going to be much bigger than the agenda that you're putting on this table right that, now. That's assuming a lot. I, I don't know that you have better vision than than some of the guys have been advocating in the locker rooms. You know, but mm -hmm. you know, obviously the the players in the locker rooms. At any given time, you know, there it's their bodies online. Concussions wasn't even an issue a few years back. Now it is, you know, and and to watch the NCAA dismiss it, you know, the what ifs and and trying to dredge up some type of worst case scenario, um, I don't think that should be the problem. I don't think that should trump players' rights and protections. I think uh, players need to to be able to get in there right now um, because they're they're exposed 
uh, currently. We're going, everybody, I just want to hammer this. We're going into a new football <coughs> season. Will college athletes have protections on, on brain trauma, you know, to minimize the risk or not? How about that question being posed to the NCAA? There's plenty they can do that, that costs no money. They can reduce contact in practices. They can implement and enforce return to play protocols. Um, there's a drum roll right now, you know, and, and I hope it's not the same result as we've seen the last few years, but I don't think that um, some of the, you know, kind of the worst case scenario pictures should, dic should dictate whether or not these players stand up for these protections. Kane, I know right now you're um, training for your pro day. Do you feel like this is taking your attention away from that at all? I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just curious. I, I know they're both big issues, and you're, put, you're stepping. You know, you have one foot in the NFL and one foot in uh, one foot still in college. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, you know, obviously I've, my priority has, has been to you know achieve my lifelong dream of making it to the NFL, and I've been out in Florida training. So you know, people might be thinking I'm you know with a movie all the time, but you know, really I've been I've been training and. Um, you know, when, when I can, I, I definitely you know, give my support and do what I need to do um, as, as far as the union goes. But I hope the NFL sees this as a sign of leadership, a sign of me protecting my brothers, you know, my family, you know, is really where every football team is. And just trying to protect those guys, set those guys up for success. And at the end of the day, I'll never let um, either one almost, you know, overwhelm me. You know, I'd be able to focus on football and I never let that interfere to what I could give to a team. Good multitasker. Yeah. Uh, just a question about, real quick, you guys obviously petitioned to be employees of Northwestern. You know, you've obviously said many times, you know, Northwestern never restricted you as a student there. I, I firmly believe, you know, people like Jim Phillips care about the athletes. Was there ever a possibility to unionize as NCAA employees? Did, did it have to be Northwestern? I mean, obviously, you guys are more the experts on that. You know, how did that soon come about? Because yeah. it seems like more of an NCAA fight than a Northwestern fight. I, I, I don't think the, the, the players are clearly not fighting Northwestern. You know, I think, you know, some of the way things are framed, you know, you're either a student athlete or you're an employee. Actually, we just proved that you're all three. You're a student, you're an athlete, you're an employee. Um, you can either stand up for your rights um, you, either, you can either fight Northwestern or, or keep the status quo. No, I think you can love Northwestern and still, um, you know, explain that college athletes have rights. You know, they don't, they don't have to conflict. So the way some of these things are framed are, you know, um, from people who are opposing this um, are really false dichotomies and, and, and framed very, very um, problematically for what's really going on. Uh, but the NCAA is actually not the employer. You know, the, the scholarships come directly from the schools. So the NCAA, um, you know, down the line, I, I, actually, what I was going to get back into, what I do envision is um, the possibility, skip, skip forward 13 years, um, that these players can possibly negotiate by conference or maybe by the NCAA under, under one umbrella. Um, because at that point, you know, um, you know, that would be, those would be critical masses, you know, we'd be reaching critical masses to where conferences and or the NCAA says, okay, let's do this uniformly and um, get this, you know, both sides can have input about uh, conditions across the nation instead of just on campus. Pardon my uh, personal ignorance about your personal stories, but for each of you, when when did when was your light bulb moment when when this really something happened you when you when you said something's got to change here? Well, I mean, I, I've been around the, the game for a long time. My uncle played, my father played, and obviously, I went through my experience, and I had seen, you know, through my uncle and my my father, some of the pitfalls in the system, and um, you know, obviously, going through my times and I. I Basically, I reached out and I tried to see if there was an entity in place that, that um, resembled a union or resembled, you know, players getting a voice because obviously we didn't. And I found Ramogi and uh, I was given the opportunity to make a change to, to you know, make the system better than, uh, better than how I found it. And that was really kind of my light bulb moment was, uh, you know, talking to, talking to him and, and um, you know, us both having inspiration to, to change the game for the better. And for me, it was, it was a no-brainer. Yeah, it was an you know, honor. So, uh, for me, I played football at UCLA long ago. I guess Kane reminds me uh, in 1995 that uh, one of um, one of my teammates was uh, suspended after he uh, ended up eating groceries that were left anonymously on his doorstep because he had been on a radio show talking about how tough it was to get by. You know, he said, "I'm, I'm grateful um, for my opportunity, but I I don't have any food in the refrigerator right now." Goes home, there's groceries. He ends up eating them, and somehow the NCAA found out. And when they found out, they suspended him. 
Um, he, Donnie Edwards. He was an All-American linebacker. Mm -hmm. They're selling his jersey in the store. And I myself, I was on campus where you can slide three meal cards. But coming from high school when I was eating five, six meals a day to three meals and bringing all these extra thousands of calories, I lost 10 pounds by the time Donnie had been suspended. You know, we're 5-0. and uh, We're 12th in the nation filling up the stands. Coach is driving a Cadillac, and, and Donnie gets suspended over food. And we don't even have a voice. You know, there's, UCLA says, look, we do everything we can under NSA rules. And then going into summer workouts, we were told, should we be injured uh, during summer workouts? The NCAA prohibits all schools from paying for any medical expenses. And that was the rule at the time. So I actually started a student group um, right after my second year on campus with the, the idea that we can go and reach out to other schools because I just felt instinctively that if players got together, they could finally channel power that they, they obviously had. And so that's kind of how it started. Given that um, a bargaining unit kind of has uh, similar similarities in uh, their job description, their employer, um, how do you see the situation working out for people who do graduate and do, don't have that similar situation as current players do? What, what, what do you see that situation? Um, well, I think I think the players, the way that the ruling came down is the players actually have to be have some remaining eligibility to be in the unit, but those players can still negotiate for protections for former players. So when they transition out, for instance, if a former player has an injury that needs a, uh, some kind of care down the line, um, they can try to negotiate and get some protections for former players as well. Um, but if a player is in grad school, for instance, in their last year, um, I think the scholarship is the, is the primary um, determinant of the employee status and the fact that players are still providing athletic services. I don't think that it will be, you know, anyone in grad school will be excluded from the, from the bargaining unit. So even if they uh, per se, that they go on to get a job two years to three years down the line after graduating, um, they would still, are you trying to propose that they still have some of those uh, benefits, I guess, those medical benefits? Right, so for instance, if you have a job down the line, um, and you know, most, most people that have insurance through their, through their employer, there's still deductibles or co-pays and some of those other things um, that we're looking to make sure players aren't stuck with out-of-pocket expenses. Some players have awful insurance, former players have awful, and you have a $10,000 deductible. And if you need a knee replacement or something, you know, 10 years after you play, that, you know, again, with the revenue that's being generated, there can be policies taken out to make sure that, you know, something reasonable can be set up. I have one last question. I know you guys got to get going. Um, 10 years from now, after this issue is resolved, after the Kessler lawsuit is resolved, let, and let's assume, let's assume you win all three. Kessler, unionization, and the uh, O'Bannon lawsuit which is really about who gets access to the media revenues. Um, what does the product look like for, for fans? Is it, is it much different? Is it any different? I think that's a great question. First of all, I'd like to, you know, those are complete, those are all different, you know, uh, exclusively different um, battlefronts, I guess you can say. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, this is car sports. You know, uh, people say, well, are they going to be students? No one is proposing that they not be students. You know, I think that's what makes it special. You know, the notion of amateurism has long been um, proven to be ridiculous and a myth, and, and, and people love college sports. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you're still going to have people tailgating, you know, before the games. They're still going to be wearing their, their school colors um, of their favorite team. And um, college athletes will still be students as well. And uh, it'll, it'll be actually a better sport because then when you see a player go down in school colors, you're not going to have to wonder, wow, is he going to be taken care of down the line? Is that your vision too? You're on the board of uh, Regents for uh, University of Maryland. No, I don't have quite that vision, but we'll hold that for another day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hold their fight, so. Okay. A right. AFL CIO just tweeted solidarity with the fact that you're even here and doing this, by the way. Oh, that's yeah. great. Great. Yeah. That's cool. All right, Wilson, thank you, Kane. Thank you. 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 Thank you